Chapter 15 Merging of Beingness Within Itself is the Very Fount of Bliss. Before the emanation of any words, I already exist. Later, I say mentally, I am. The word free and thought free state is the Atman. The Atman per se is self sufficient, but when it clings to the body, Treatments such as mental and physical recreation or occupation are necessary. Without these, the Atman cannot be tolerated by a person. For spiritual evolution, which is a requisite in the disengagement of the Atman from the body identity, various disciplines have been recommended. Among these, the best is Namasmarana, recitation of a holy name of God. But here God means the indwelling principle within you the Atman, which is given various names. These represent this inner God, who will respond no matter what names of other gods you chant. The custom of counting beads on a rosary is merely to give occupation to your hands, but it is this inner God that you are supposed to invoke. This God is awakened when you tell the beads by reciting his name. Just as the cow's udders ooze out milk upon the side of its calf who runs to its mother mooing, Ama, Ama, so also the beingness showers grace on one who chants its holy name and tells the beads in all earnestness by leading him into quietude. The keynote of recitation is to confine this I amness within itself. The listener in you listens to the chantings and feels greatly pleased. This is the reason that people used to the daily chantings and telling of beads get restless when unable to do so. Tukaram, the poet saint of Maharashtra, affirms this same principle when he sings in one of his couplets, Triumphant am I in locking in my beingness in itself with my devotion. Thus have I reached the very pinnacle of my spiritual search resulting in the drying up of my mental inclinations. The merging of beingness within itself is the very fount of bliss. Many sages who are in such a state are quite oblivious to the physical condition and simply lie on the ground, reveling in themselves. Some misguided seekers with the aid of drugs such as marijuana artificially induce a state of forgetfulness but this is benumbing the senses by extraneous means. Such people will not have enduring peace, only hangovers and sour heads. If you want eternal peace, you can have it and be it through the absorbing devotional path, the Namajapa or Bhakti Yoga. March 30th, 1980 Chapter 16 Try to understand the ignorant child principle. What I am talking about is the knowledge of totality. It is not a piece of information. I ponder over manifestation as a whole while you pick up only a fragment, a concept out of my talks and say, I like this idea, and then give it a high status by naming it as Brahman, Vishnu, etc. But you do not attempt to comprehend the total and wholesome meaning. You have been talking about this ignorant child principle. Could you explain this a bit more fully? When an infant is born, he is just an innocuous form of flesh and bones and all innocence. He has no mentation, but has the instinct for eating, evacuation, and crying. In due course, this lump of flesh develops the capacity for knowledge and action. Gradually, the knowingness I am is felt by it and this is followed by the mind. This I amness feeling before the formation of mind is the ignorant child principle, termed the Balkrishna state. It is this very principle which is the source or foundation on which the infancy develops into childhood, boyhood, teenage, and so on, undergoing physical and biological changes all the time. Eventually, manhood is attained when all physical and mental faculties reach their peak. But what is the root of all these attainments? It is that ignorant child principle only, 
which develop with growth exclusively from inside to outside. During its growth to adulthood and later it receives, records, and reacts to all the impressions through its senses and the mind. But all this happens only after it knows itself. Your erroneous concept of knowledge is that of collecting information and ideas from the outside through the five senses of knowledge or perception. Then you give out this information to others as important knowledge and are fascinated by it. But when I talk about knowledge, I do not refer to this but to the knowledge that you are, your beingness, to the child principle or the Balkrishna state which is the root cause of all your acquisitions, both spiritual and worldly. You should try to understand what this child principle is. I am dealing with this only and not with your so-called knowledge gained externally through the senses. This Bal Krishna principle has great potential. It is the chemical that can develop photographic memories, can retain and reproduce whatever was read or heard only once. This is the innate capacity of the non-knowing, ignorant child principle, Bal Krishna. Here, Bal means the food, essence, child body, and Krishna means non-knowing, that is, ignorance. But it has the potential to receive, respond, and react. You are not doing anything. All this is happening spontaneously in you. If you want to understand the deep underlying meaning of this, go to the very source, to your beingness, and hold on to that. But above all, do not collect concepts. Here these talks proceed as automatically as breathing. Hundreds of people come and listen to the talks, but I do not assume any pose. Why? In the speck of my beingness with the beingness, while I observed myself and everything else, Realization occurred to me. Henceforth, all happenings took place spontaneously. Even the talks here are spontaneous occurrences, and so I am not the speaker, nor am I in this state the child principle, Bar Krishna, as I abide in the Absolute. April 4th, 1980 Chapter 17 To know what one is, one must know one's beginning. What is the difference between spirituality and discrimination? Discrimination means selecting words and meanings worthy of us. Nevertheless, words that are worthy of our true nature and describe our ultimate state are never available. Out of a heap of wheat you pick up and collect good wheat for your consumption, while rejecting stones and bad wheat. Similarly, discrimination is to be used. At present you identify yourself with your body and mind. Therefore, in the initial stages of your spiritual practice, you should reject the identity by imbibing the principle that I am is the vital breath, and the consciousness only and not the body and mind. In the later stages, the vital breath and the consciousness, that is, the knowledge I am, merge in one's ultimate nature. Just as the thoughts of a professor or pandit subside in him when he goes to sleep, a person in deep sleep does not know himself, because even the sense of his beingness has merged in him. When you realize that you are neither the body nor the mind, you will remain unaffected by any mental modifications. In that state, you are the dynamic universal consciousness. You should abide in this state. Pleasure, pain, and miseries are felt so long as identification with the body and mind is retained. Suppose a ship sank in mid-ocean with thousands of passengers. Could their identities survive the calamity in the absence of their bodies and minds? Further, could the victims have any idea about themselves after such a tragedy, when their bodies have totally vanished? Under these circumstances, even their surviving relatives are unable to visualize the state of the unfortunate passengers. To determine an identity, a body, vital breath, and beingness are prerequisites. 
compassion, forgiveness, peace, and attachment relate to the domain of human existence. Am I right in saying this? These qualities are significant so long as the beingness is there, as a result of the functioning of a body and the vital breath. When these three principles function coherently, everything is there. Otherwise, nothing is. Spirituality means abidance in the self. When you discuss or think of any topic such as discrimination or spirituality, you study it objectively and fractionally, but I do it subjectively and totally by pointing to the all-embracing principle, the self. Understand the self. Be the self. So long as your body, the vital breath, and the beingness are there, you know that you are. When the vital breath goes, the body drops off and the beingness extinguishes. The process is termed death. One who is dead cannot know anything. A dead one does not know he is or he was. So there is no registering of such a dead one's existence either with us or with the one. Go to the root of your beingness. In the process, the beingness will be transcended and the ultimate you only remain without the knowledge you are. That ultimate state is known as Vishranti, which means total rest, complete relaxation, utter quietude, etc. The other meaning by splitting the word would be Vishara Anti, forget yourself in the end. That means in the ultimate state, you areness is totally forgotten. Whether I am or I am not, both are forgotten. This is the highest type of rest, Parama Vishranti. Don't meekly accept what I say. If you have doubts, by all means, ask questions. If anybody is going to ask questions, they will be from the body-mind level, and mind means whatever one has collected from the outside. It is not one's own. So ask only about what has been discussed from the correct standpoint. How to experience that highest state? There is no question of experiencing. You are that state only. All experiences derived through the senses. Yes, but you, the ultimate experiencer, are not merely the sum total of experiences. And waking up, you know you are. This is your knowingness. Prior to this knowingness, whatever you are, it is not the knowingness. Does this have anything to do with the ultimate? There are many titles and attributes, but prior to all attributes, you are. Do we have realization? These are all concepts. The ultimate state, however, is beyond the grasp of words. Out of one concept, more concepts are born, and everything is going on with and through these concepts. Thus, the storehouse is filled with concepts. But when the primary concept itself is abolished, where is the question of further concepts? Is this I exaggerated or not? What is your age? Sixty-one years. Going back in time to one day prior to those sixty-one odd years of your lifespan, did you know that you were going to take birth? Obviously not. I had no idea that I was going to be born before my birth. Now, having been born, did you ever inquire why at all you were born? Earlier, this I amness knowledge was not there before birth. I do not know when I was born, nor do I know when I am going to die. But all these days, why did you not make the inquiry? Now that you have the knowledge I am, how did you come to it? Granted that you were born unknowingly, but like a man asleep on waking finds that he has a large boil. Will he not inquire, where did I get this boil? I did inquire. With whom did you inquire? What answer did you get? But I did not get any answer. How and why this knowledge I am? How did this knowledge I am appear from the non-knowing state? I don't know. You must know that. What is the use of all types of information? Thousands of people have drowned in a ship. What information can you have about their present state? Death. Obviously nothing. 
Can the one who did not know about death of birth have knowledge of his death? We shall have to inquire from the dead person. Are you going to inquire from the dead? Unknowingly this knowingness has appeared. How? From nothingness this I amness has appeared. How? Prior to your birth did you ever experience your I amness? Probably not. Why probably? Definitely no collection of any information regarding the non knowing state is merely an idle inquiry. Why do you class that knowingness now? Since you are going to meet death definitely? Prior to birth you did not know you were. You are going to die. Then why are you clinging to all these concepts of heaven, hell, virtue, and sin? Will you care to turn around and observe, now that you have heard all these talks? Sometimes I do. What is the use of that? Finally, you must come to the conclusion that there is no such thing as the me and the mine. See at least your beginning. Probably we have a right to the beginning and not to the end. I am interested only in your beginning. How did you happen to be? It is most important. I am interested in me and myself. But did you come to know what you are? You bless me. You place before me your identity and then I bless it. When one does not know his very beginning, how can he plead for anyone? Although you know full well that you do not know, why do you still embrace all this? It is all instinct. We naturally embrace all this. What is that instinctive uprising? What is it that is born? You are not concerned about it. You do not have the knowledge because you do not have the urge. If you have a deep urge, then only will there be illumination. Until then, you will be making all the efforts while someone else will be taking the advantage, like a blind man working on a grinding stone while a dog eats all the flour. Now, how should we get rid of this blindness? By abiding in the self through insistence, meditate on the self. You must do Hatha Yoga of insistence and perseverance to have perfect knowledge about the self. Is there anybody who has such knowledge? Yes, a rare one, one in ten million. Having come upon these mathematical odds, do you now give up on the inquiry? I do not want to give up. Have you come to this conclusion after pinching your ears? What is the use of striving all along? What is the use of any of your concepts? Ayani is beyond concept. He gives no importance to any concept. He may not know how much we are striving now and have done so earlier. You have no idea. Ramakrishna Paramahamsa appealed to the mother. O oh mother, take me beyond thought and knowledge as I get mad with them. Did you try it yourself? Did you go beyond thought and knowledge? If not, why do you refer to others? No. If you have not tried the recipe on yourself, why do you talk about it? Why do you introduce someone else's judgment? Can you remain alive without words? Without them, how can you manage your daily activities? I know the history of your birth. Why you call a person your father or mother? I know full well. Why do you bother about others instead of bothering about your own self? Others, such as Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. If you are ignorant, it is all right to inquire about others. But when you are concerned about yourself, then inquire about yourself only. When I pleased my I amness by understanding it, only then did I come to know this I amness and in the process also discovered that I, the Absolute, am not that I am. Stay put at one place. Having collected all the knowledge, ponder over it in seclusion. If Maharaj blesses me, I shall have enlightenment. That is not so simple. It is just like saying that a married couple will beget children merely if somebody blesses them. The knowledge I am is a curse. It is accidental, spontaneous. The beginning of I am is when I get the phone message that I am. And when I have the information, I am, that is the Ganesha state. 
Why is Ganesha equated with the primordial sound Pranava, that is Aum? Because Ganesha represents the knowledge Prana, the vital breath. Out of the Pranava, the product of Prana, the vocal language develops after passing through four stages. That is, Para, Pajyanti, Madhyama, Vekari. Para is the source and the subtlest stage. Vekhari is the grossest, representing the bursting out of vocal language. The state prior to para is love to be, the sense of love, which gives rise to all activities. That state is Ganesha. July 26th, 1980 Chapter 18 Your beingness is the beginning and end of the mind. One Spanish gentleman who visited here had practiced a lot of meditation, but he could not get rid of attachment. So long as you are attached to the body, you will not be able to transcend attachment to various people and things. Whenever I try to get hold of myself, I feel the absence of love for my relatives. Do not be concerned about other people. Be concerned with yourself. After doing meditation, I lost love for others. It is not that your love became less. The love now merges in your own self. Your own beingness is love and bliss. You have objectified your love. Your very nature is love. By stabilizing in beingness, you collect all the love which was diffused and spread outside. You abide in that knowledge I am. Whatever you are inside the body represents love only. This love works, collects food, eats, digests, and acquires knowledge. You are, is the love, and expresses itself through the vital breath. That is, activities go on because of the vital breath. Just as the body has a number of limbs for carrying out worldly activities, so the knowledge you are has the vital breath as its limb for activity. It is not a question of loving others, but directly knowing what you are. That love is looking after you. It is your nourishment, your motive, and energizing force. You focus your attention there. Its movement is indicated by the vital breath. It is the life force. The tangible feeling of manifestation is the knowledge you are. This love is the universal love, not directed at any particular person or thing. It is very much like space. Space does not say, I am exclusively for so-and-so. It does not make love privately to someone. That love is manifest and universal. Because you identify with the body, all the troubles begin. Primary love is love to be. Only after that can you think of loving others. Why do you strive to be? Simply because you love to be. The biggest stumbling block is the identification with the body-mind. Understand that it is not that you can become God. You are God. You are godly originally, but you become something you are not. You should understand that your destination is your own self, the I am. It is the very source of everything. That I am is to be realized. That is the destination, but how to reach it? You are derailed from the search because of the body. You toppled from the godly vantage point by catching hold of the body. Because you are, the consciousness is. Before you say I am, you already are. Agreed? You know now that you are. Be that. Here I am not going to tell you what is written in the scriptures, however sophisticated they may be. I am going to tell you simply that you are. If you like my talks, you may come. If you do not like them, then stay away. At present, you may consider yourself to be an insignificant person of limited worth, intelligence. But actually, it is not so. You are very ancient. You are infinite, eternal. This feeling of I amness is like an advertisement. It indicates that eternal state. 
I am. The word or the feeling I am feeling that you get inside is not eternal, but you are eternal and ancient. How to understand that I am eternal? This cannot be understood in the usual intellectual way. That state is spontaneously realized. When you are in the state of I amness, you merge in the eternal state. Now you know that you are and that you are sitting. How did you develop this conviction? I know I am sitting here. In the same way, you must develop the conviction that you are the absolute. This is most important. You have to focus your attention on that only. Before the appearance of the beingness or knowingness, I, the Absolute, am already there eternally. Who will focus attention? Who knows that this is focusing of attention? That which focuses attention is prior to attention. In the mind, how can you meditate? In what you call meditation, you need an object. Who observes the meditation? Who practices the meditation? The process necessitates the presence of someone as well as an object, does it not? But before anything else, the meditator must be present. Now let him alone be without any object. In true meditation, the meditator is alone, without any object to meditate upon. Prior to the waking state, I or the Absolute ever is. On waking, it dawns upon me that I am. And only after that, all other happenings and things come to mind. Again, I, the Absolute, must be before the waking state. Stay put here. Abide therein. You have to stabilize in your present true nature, I am. All other secondary and redundant objects should be got rid of. Do not focus your attention on any of these things. The whole process is to be in your source. At present, what is your source? I am. Catch hold of that I amness and be in it. You have to realize your own self. You must be at the borderline between I am and not I am. Suppose it does not occur to you that you are. Does it mean that you are not? If that I amness is not there, you, the Absolute, are. As such, you prevail prior to and during and after the waking state. During the waking state, the sense of I amness perceives the world, and from the standpoint of you, the Absolute, there is witnessing of I amness and its perceptions. I do want to do something spiritual. Do you want self knowledge or not? You want to do something spiritual, but you must be there for doing something. You must know you. Who is the doer of spirituality? I am as the doer. When you are involved in daily activities in the house, street, and office, who is the common factor? It is your I amness. This I amness of yours is doing everything. Suppose from the morning till night I have been doing a lot of things. What is the sum? total of my activities. All these many activities took place in my state of beingness. In deep sleep, I am went into oblivion. It forgot itself. Then what is the use of everything that was done? Beingness is not an eternal state. It is a temporary phase, a passing show. Consciousness is the product of the five elements and their interactions. The result of the five elements is temporary, time-bound. Your knowingness and all that you accumulate always come subsequent to your beingness. You can know something only when knowingness knows it is. Your fall occurs when you try to identify something within the sphere of consciousness as yourself. Your consciousness manifests the world. When you try to equate the body with yourself, the fall begins. Who thinks I am the consciousness? You! Without beingness, there is no thinking. Beingness is a basic precondition for thinking or not thinking. Suppose you have pain in the body. Who witnesses that pain? Your beingness only witnesses it. In the absence of beingness, 
How can there be witnessing at all? The real witness is the eternal self only. So long as beingness is there, you are the beingness. When the beingness is not, you are the absolute. Everybody that comes here has to go. Similarly, the beingness which has come must go. July 28th, 1980 Chapter 19 For a realized one, the whole functioning in the world is a bhajan. What does Maharaj think of the materialization and dematerialization of physical objects as demonstrated by Satya Sai Baba? However, I do not want to restrict this phenomenon to Satya Sai Baba. It is just entertainment. Leave it alone. What you are and what I am are also concepts. Without concepts, the world could not function. The world is going on. Nevertheless, whatever has appeared in worldly life is only illusion. An event which has happened already, or whatever is gone, does it come back? No one knows. Similar things may happen, but they will never be identical. Can you tell me about reincarnation? According to one's firm conviction, the one who dies will have another dream, in which he will be reborn. What is the apparent cause of rebirth? Is it due to past karma? And is there such a thing as karma at all? Karma comprises your physical and mental activities. But actually, there are happenings due to the three gunas, sattva, rajas, and tamas. That is, beingness, dynamic quality, and the claim of doership, respectively. How does one get away from oneself? Most people seem to be stuck in patterns which are fetters of concepts. Who says that? My observation. So long as you know you are, it is always with you and it never leaves. How should I be liberated from the concepts? First, you must come to know what you are. Can you suggest some techniques? They are Tantra, Mantra, and Yantra. Tantra is a technique. Mantra is a fixed series of sacred words. And Yantra is a machine for spiritual progress. You should understand and assimilate what I expound and advocate. Then be yourself and let go. I cannot easily translate into action whatever you tell me. It is not that you should transform yourself. You have actually converted yourself into something other than yourself. Now you should reconvert yourself into your original self. Stabilize in yourself. Because you want to be, you occupy yourself with talking and all else. To sustain this you are, you carry out various activities. Thus you keep your mind busy. But to the realized one, the mind flow is like the release of obnoxious gases from below. The one who is stabilized in the self looks down upon the mind chattering as though it were dirty and unwanted like those gases in the stomach. When you are in the ignorant state, questions arise about good and bad and about making choices for accepting or rejecting. But in the state of knowledge, Things happen spontaneously and there is no choosing and discarding. Even the apparently ritualistic actions of a realized one, such as bhajans, singing, or chanting in praise of gods, etc., are spontaneous expressions. They are not planned but just happen. For the realized one, the whole functioning in the world is a bhajan. All the happenings are the result of you, the motive force. Although activities are happening spontaneously, you want to claim doership for them. But such a claim arises from your identity with the body-mind. Having acquired spiritual knowledge, what are you going to do for the benefit of the world? I will just be. People who have a liking for social work want to do something good. They want to transform the quality of the intellect of other people so they live in harmony with each other. The world is the expression of the truth, and people should be helped to understand this. If that is to happen, it will happen by itself. That which is changing continuously is the unreal. Change can be brought about only in the unreal. 
No change can be made in the real, the truth. In the world, you can affect improvement in the concepts, but do not dare call the concepts the truth. The truth can understand untruth, but untruth understand truth. Just as you change garments, you change your concepts, and then you feel happy. The truth cannot be seen or perceived, but the truth can observe the untruth. With concepts, I shall not be happy. Is it correct? You think that with concepts you can be happy. The happiness or bliss which reveals itself in the no concept state cannot be perceived. In life, there are moments of peace when we get a glimpse of the truth, and the faith developed as a result influences and guides our life. These are only words, and words do not contain the truth. The truth does not need the help of words. Whatever you say is experience, but you are the experiencer, and without it, also you are. Experiences come and go, but the experiencer remains. You experience the world, but you are prior to the world. World is experiential, but you, the absolute, are non-experiential. At present, the sense of you areness is felt, but it is a temporary state. It will go. A hundred years ago, that is prior to birth, this you areness was not associated with you, the absolute. This you are experience has come as a fever. How and why this fever has come? For this, there is no explanation or reason. In an instant, you came out of the sickness. You are. Is there any hope for me, too, to experience such a sublime moment? Yes, provided you understand and assimilate this talk. Whatever is now is the sense of being for all of us. First, one has to abide in it, and finally, it is to be transcended. This morning in meditation, I felt I was not in the body-mind, but only in the beingness. That is the consciousness. It is the manifest state in which there is no personality, no male or female. It is the knowledge you are. For some time there was no sense of beingness also. That was a state of stillness and only the consciousness was there. Some say that the sense of I am is to the right side of the chest, about four fingers away from the center. That depends upon the individual experience. The location may vary according to the person but do not understand or locate it with reference to the body. An Indian seeker comes to Maharaja's place after roaming a lot in the neighborhood in search of the address. Do you know this locality? Did you walk around a lot to find it? Yes, sir. I used to visit this area a few years back to meet a sage like Fakir. Did he teach you anything? No, but he had certain powers. A few years ago, there was an explosion on a ship at anchor in the Bombay Harbor. This Fakir, who happened to be close by before the explosion, had a premonition. He shouted at the people around him and ordered them to rush out of the area immediately. Once he blessed me by patting me on the head, and I felt as if my kundalini energy rose upward. That reminds me of another Fakir of great attainments by the name of Tiku Baba. He lived in the Kolaba district. Though I have not seen him personally, we used to have communication with each other through a messenger of Fakir, who often used to visit my Bidi shop. Tiko Baba has great powers for doing miracles. One day, the messenger of Fakir had gone to see Tiko Baba late one night. To his consternation, he found Tiko Baba's body dismembered and his limbs stacked together. Fearing that it might well be a case of murder, he ran away from the place where the fakir lived. Out of curiosity, he returned the next morning, and to his great surprise, found Tiku Baba hale and hearty. One day the messenger arrived at my shop with a message from Tiku Baba that I should come and meet him at the earliest moment because his end was near. It was further conveyed that before he was to leave the body, he would like to transfer all his powers to me. In response, I offered my thanks and told the messenger, Please tell Tiku Baba that the bargain is struck only once. 
By this I meant that a true disciple accepts the Guru only for once and remains devoted to him, and that he does not run after other Gurus. When this message was received by Tiku Baba, he remarked, Oh, he has reached the destination and is beyond any needs. October 22, 1980 Chapter 20 Hold on to your sense of being. The universal consciousness is all-pervading, and it does not suffer any loss or gain as a result of interaction in the five-elemental play. However, in this process of interaction, it manifests in a tangible way. Maharaj takes up a metal flower vase and drops it on the floor, which results in a clanging sound. When one object came in touch with another, the sound which was latent became apparent. Maharaj picks up a towel and points out that fire is latent in the cloth. Fire manifests only when there is action on the towel, i.e. by applying flame to it. And as a reaction, fire manifests and the towel burns. The consciousness is there all the time. Life is there all the time, and life will manifest itself when there is a form. Consciousness goes into action, i.e. becomes manifest, perceptible, just as the sound takes place or the cloth catches fire. And similar to the fact that there is no particular identity for the sound or the fire, so there is no identity for the consciousness. Out of ignorance and identification with the body, you experience pleasure and pain, and even though consciousness is universal and just functions through the body. So many people have died, so many people are murdered, but consciousness has ever remained the same. It has not been diminished or aggrandized in any way. It has not suffered at all. Maharaj again bangs the vase and points out that the sound just happens. There is no pain or pleasure for the sound. It just manifests. So also the consciousness, which has no pain or pleasure. There is no loss or gain to the five elements. All these calamities that man experiences will not give pleasure or pain, not only to the five elements, but also the various qualities gunas perceive by the senses. The five qualities are touch, form, smell, taste, and sound. Now, what is the significance of that you for you? Do not get involved in your wants. Where are you proceeding to? Think on these lines. The five elements are playing, and as a result of their interplay, forms are created, and these are equipped with five senses. From the five elemental objects, namely vegetation and food, the form takes shape. Now through this form, the consciousness manifests again the qualities, gunas, of the five elements. Ponder over this and find out what are you? And where are you proceeding towards? All along, thousands of wars have been fought. Now, what has been the effect of all that on the five elements? These five elements are perceived by the five body senses. Because of the derailment of the five elements from the highest, this guna, the consciousness, has emerged. Suppose somebody is murdered. Actually, what did happen? The indwelling consciousness in the body that was murdered went into oblivion and functioning of the five senses came to a halt. Millions of people are killed and gone. Did the five senses and their consciousness come to you, raising any disputes? With the body, five senses of perception and five limbs of action are provided. With age, this body deteriorates and the senses and limbs no longer operate as effectively. Thus, with the gradual failure of the senses and limbs due to aging, the guna, that is consciousness, is also dwindling. That is, its manifestation as such weakens. And all these functions of the body, senses, limbs, and consciousness, where do you fit in as such? And where do you proceed to? 
The various processes and events are due to the food body and prana. Where is your position therein? Is consciousness independent of the body, that is, unaffected by it? How can it be so? It is the outcome of the food essence body and is called sattva guna. Similarly, a child is also the essence of its parents' bodies. If a child is deformed, it is because of some inadequacy in the quality of the material food body. The worldly activities and also the spiritual ones carried out with the mind are mere amusements in the state of ignorance. They began when the sense of being started to function with the cycle of waking and sleep. If a person thinks that by practicing spirituality something can be gained, I would like to know the design and identity of such a one. Spiritual seekers, instead of inquiring into their very nature which is their consciousness, delve into spiritual books for knowledge. Should we give up all the concepts and ideas collected thus far? Do nothing of the sort. Just hold on to your sense of being so long as you know you are. Be only in that state. Do not worry about its going away. Should we commit to memory the sense of being? But that would mean effort. Where is the question of effort on your part? The consciousness spontaneously came into being. Consciousness itself is of the attention. Be there. Do not try to alter or modify anything. Whatever is, is there. And that is the love of the self, Atma Prem. If you can derive satisfaction by reading and following traditional so-called spiritual paths and disciplines, by all means do it. But Maharaj says we have to reach a destination. Where's the question of proceeding to a destination and who is there to proceed? Maharaj bangs a piece of metal. Take this sound. Where does it go? A yani is totally away from all concepts. At that point, there is nothing. Yesterday, you spoke about Guru in Satguru Charan, the feet of the Satguru. Yes, I did. Satguru Charan means the spontaneous appearance of consciousness when you know you are. Everything dwells in this knowledge you are, and it is limitless and all-prevailing. This state represents the sacred feet of Satguru. I mean no offense at all when I ask a silly question. Why are there so many photographs on these walls? I feel this goes contrary to your teaching. They are the relics of the period of ignorance. To dispel the ignorance, such aids are necessary. When the purpose is served, they are no longer required. This body, which I use, is also an outcome of the ignorant stage but it is still in use though I have transcended the stage of ignorance. So let the photographs remain to decorate the walls. There is no harm in that. Instead of changing things on the outside, why not bring about a change within by removing your wrong identities? You talk as if you have wisdom, but what knowledge have you actually? Your present capital is the cycle of waking, deep sleep, and knowledge I am. What else have you got? This cycle has appeared by itself without your asking. All else you have learned and acquired later. Anybody who comes here is like an ignorant child in spite of whatever so-called knowledge he has gained from outside. November 13th, 1980 Chapter 21 Return to the State Before Birth I once felt the sense of individuality. But I do not now have that individuality. The sense of individuality has transformed itself into the universal manifest state. Did it happen just like that? The moment the name of the disease emerged, the feeling of being an individual arose. Now the sense of individuality is gone and only the feeling of universal consciousness remains. The individuality is gone together with the identity of body form. The body is not my design, nor am I male or female. Everything happens spontaneously. Who sees that the day has dawned and the sun shines? Could the knowledge of the day be the individual's? 
The moment one wakes up, the I amness arises, which means the sense of being only. Later also, the sense of body is there. This sense of beingness is all pervading, and it has no name and no form. It is existence itself. When the body suffers, what actually happens? What is the relationship between the unmanifest and the body, or between the actual and the illusory appearances in the world? They are intimately related. The culture and sentiment of every atom is different, so also every individual is different in this world. There are varieties of expressions in atoms and subatoms. Is the truth manifest or unmanifest? If the truth manifests through the body, then all the diseases of the body are in the unmanifest. When the unmanifest manifests, it is called Saguna Brahman. This Brahman principle is ample, plenty, and manifest, and comprises the five elements, three gunas, and Prakriti Purush. It is this that recognizes the sun and the space, and is more pervasive and subtler than space even. What is all this play about in this manifest universe which is the outcome of the unmanifest? A body suffers from sickness, the body of Maharaj. As a result, we also suffer after witnessing the sickness. Why all this nuisance? If your I amness is not, who would observe the rising of the sun? Although you have explained it a thousand times, I still have not understood. Who and what as such at the highest level are nothing. Whatever is, is very clear and obvious. But such a simple fact has turned into a riddle because that principle has identified itself wrongly with a form and then takes pride in that identification. It has accepted body as its identity. But why should this happen to you through whose body the unmanifest manifests itself? In order to have a reply to this question, you will have to retreat into yourself. Out of this atomic touch, this speck of consciousness, all this magnificent universe has materialized. How and what would you reply to this question? Did it create itself or did it arrange for the creation? Your reply will be mere conjecture and guesswork. What evidence have you that you have births and deaths? What proof have you about rebirth? Do you mean to say that we should remain at the point of emergence of consciousness? Shall we then understand this? Yes, I have been telling people exactly that. Then you mean to say that unless I stop at the rising of consciousness, I shall not understand this play of the unmanifest, manifest, body suffering, etc., and that all my talking is actually only blabbering and therefore a mere nuisance? Yes, it is just entertainment to pass the time. That means when we visit and sit near you, in fact, it bothers you. I am not bothered even by the five elements which are my creations, so how can you be a nuisance to me? If I identify myself with the body, then I will necessarily have to undergo all the botherations and sufferings that go with it. May I ask another question? You have consciousness which has reached a certain high level. Could it have a beneficial effect on us by your mere presence without any talk? Not only you, but even germs, ants, worms, and so on are the beneficiaries. That means your influence is continuously working on us, including on the smallest. For the sake of talking, it is all right, but in actuality, no one affects anyone. At the moment of its sprouting, did my birth principle have any intelligence? This birth principle, which is the child principle, grows spontaneously, develops mind and intellect, and may in due course become a Mahatma, a great sage even. But the root of that sage is the sprouting of the child principle only. Is it not so? Now you are collecting a lot of knowledge in the name of spirituality, but that is only entertainment. How can a child principle attain the status of a yani or sage? To understand this, stay there at the point of sprouting, ankura, and you be the ankura, aunkara. Aum is the beginning of words, and Maharaj directs the visitor to be in a state prior to the formation of words in his mind. 
That is all right, and I decide to remain in that Al-Qaeda state. Then what about the violence which goes on outside, in Iran, America, the USSR, etc.? Is there no connection, or have I to sit passively in the Al-Qaeda state? Both are intimately connected. But to escape from violence, suffering, exploitation, all your talk is in defense of your individuality. As a matter of fact, you are to be accused of responsibility for all that is happening. Except you, who could be the accused? To say all that, who is there but you, your sense of I amness? To state anything is, someone must be there in the first place. In your beingness, millions of sins are committed, and now you want to elude responsibility by clinging to and hiding within an individuality. All these happenings are your creations only. But you are also that, in your beingness. Totally everything is in my beingness, including yourself, but no authority whatsoever is given either to me or to you to set things right. To set matters right, can the Aumkara be of any use? Aumkara is useful for everything, and all is Aumkara, including suffering. How else could there be pleasure and pain without the realm of Omkara? Whatever sprouted is turned as birth, and with birth beingness wrongly identifies itself as a personality, resulting in pleasure and pain. With Omkara, can the Ankura sprouting be stopped? In the same way that it sprouted. Can the Omkara arrest the sprouting of Ankura, or is the Ankura a play of Omkara? Aumkara and Ankura are both experiential states. Could they be separate? What can there be without Aumkara? I want to know if there is a process which can arrest Ankura, sprouting, say by reciting the sacred mantra, Aumkara, or should we passively watch all the happenings? Every mantra has a purpose. There cannot be any mantra without a purpose. Then by reciting a mantra, everything will be recreated? Yes. Then why should we recite a mantra at all? But this mantra is without any language, without any words. Go to the root. See the actuality before you die. Abide in your true nature. But instead you are busy pampering your body, which you consider as your identity. People are devotional to God only in order to acquire things worldly. That means our devotion to God is equal to going into the marketplace for a purchase. That is the way that all human life goes on. The normal motive force is gain for all one's actions. So long as one worships God with the aim of gain, the worship will not be effective. Isn't that so? The primary motive is the love to be, to keep oneself alive. When the love to be is lost, what happens? Who is there to reply? When the love to be has subsided, who is there to say that it has subsided? Is it possible to experience Shatki, energy potential, Ananda, bliss, and Satchitananda, being consciousness bliss, or is there nothing of the sort? We have been told about Satchit and Ananda all along. If they are real, should we not proceed towards them? And if they do not exist as such, why should we strive at all for them? Our source, the root, is our sense of beingness, or the child principle. Did it engage in any activity consciously? Did it have any intelligence at all at that stage? What else is there except this primary child principle? Let someone else ask questions now. How can they ask real questions? They will pose questions after holding on to some identity, and such identities are built up after reading or listening to somebody. All this is informational knowledge collected externally, and it is not the spontaneous knowledge, the true knowledge. Who has the knowledge that one is, and what is that one is? What is this principle of Shiva? Imarati, Siv, means a touch. Show me the touch of beingness. Thoroughly observe and investigate. How did this principle, the touch of beingness, happen to be? The entire cosmic expression is the proliferation of the touch of beingness. 
This principle comprises the five elements, Trigunas and Prakriti Purush. All this is magnificent creation out of Omkara, the touch of beingness. Is it an energy, a power, or merely a notion? Whatever words, titles, or ideas occur to you, all are all right for the purpose. To this principle, titles such as Jagadamba, Mother of the Universe, Mahisa Sura Mardini, Destroyer of the Demon, Mahisa, etc., are given. What do you mean by Jagadamba? The principle which recognizes the daybreak, the waking state, is that Jagadamba? But is this principle an energy or only a concept or an illusion? Has it intelligence? It is a sort of intelligence. You may presume it to be so. What I want to know is this. This manifestation which has come out of me, am I a part of it or am I apart from it? You are not apart from it. It is your light only. Time and again it has been proclaimed through various religions, tantras, purunas, etc., that it is an energy potential. It is ananda. It is shakti. It is charged with love, etc. These are our deep-rooted impressions, and once we give them up, once we surrender them, what are we to do? Where's the need to surrender them? You have given me two levels. At one level, I see this relationship between my manifestation and me, and the other level is the sprouting or rising of the sense of I amness. What am I to do? If you are interested in levels, there are millions of them, and you may start counting. But that principle cannot be objectified as a sample for the purpose of counting. What are you? What do you feel you are? What is your specimen? What is the point in your running about here and there for social work, etc.? In this subjective world, is there anything permanent? You are trying to do so many things, such as social services to make people happy. You shave today, and tomorrow again you have to shave as your beard grows, and so on. Similarly, you make people happy today, and tomorrow they are unhappy, and again you proceed to make them happy, and so the cycle goes on. And you are caught in it. Initially, when I wanted to pursue spirituality, I gave up prapancha, the worldly life. Later I understood the meaning of spirituality and came to the conclusion that it is as discutable as used dishwater. Therefore, at present, I am in no way concerned with spirituality, since I have transcended it. I cannot discuss the topic in this manner before the general public. They would throw stones at me. What are you? What is your identity? Have you seen yourself correctly? Can you take photographs of your true identity bereft of body-mind? With this type of talk, will you care to see me again? Maharaj, after such visits when I had the great privilege of associating with you, this personage, known as Nisargadatta Maharaj, I have a feeling of having been given a certain push in my spiritual pursuit. Maybe this feeling which persists for three, four months after such visits is a sort of bewildering state of exultation. It gives an assurance that one can stop at the point of Ankura, the sprouting of I amness. This feeling itself is an indication of wisdom and intuitive apperception. In the past three or four years, when I visited you, I went back with these impressions and I used to get some peace, a sort of quietude. Yes, but that is the mere subsidence of your mental turbulence. Beyond this, it is nothing. But Maharaj, is it bad? We get the feeling of quietude and well-being after the visits. Why do you denounce it? It is only a temporary state. After some time, it will disappear. With birth, three states, deep sleep, waking, and knowingness function. What you experienced is in the domain of knowingness a time-bound state, prior to birth. Is there any need for anything? November 20th, 1980